Good morning, everyone. Um, special thanks to Theo for, um, I wouldn't be here without Theo in the literal sense. <laughs> um, but yeah, for putting this all together and yeah, he replied to my email within a minute. That was at, <laughs> at like quarter to one this morning. So, <laughs> so thank you so much for putting this together. <clears throat> so computers, they're everywhere. They've penetrated pretty much the entirety of our lives. Try losing your phone, can't do even banking. Um, the, this very presentation now is, is being done on a computer. Um, and this, penetra this penetration into this, these various dimensions within our lives is also evident in how we think of, um, I guess it's impacted how we think of how we ourselves think, and I guess how we think has impacted how um, we think computers work. So really this um, paper that I wrote um, is about the differences between how human cognition works as opposed to um, computer information processing and why this is important. So what I touch on is really who are the main proponents of cognitivism, representationism, I'll, I'll go on and define those things, um, but who are the main proponents of that and why do they think that we think like that? And I then propose alternatives to, to that viewpoint about human cognition and then talk about why it's important that we do delineate the way that computers in, process information and to the way that we as humans um, process information. So um, computationism, cognitivism, representationism, what is it? Um, briefly, it basically is the viewpoint that it, it, it views cognition in terms of rules and representations. Um, and there's a famous quote by Fodor, who is a, a very key proponent of um, cognitivism. His quote, um, I might be paraphrasing, but his quote is, there's no computation without representation or representationism. What I believe that he means there is that Cognition cannot occur without um, these kind of abstract ideas as to um, what, okay, let, let, me, let me just use an example. Basically, we have, I have a computer in front of me right now. I, the, the representationalist would argue that I see this computer, okay, what I see is simply just light, but I then turn that light into an idea, a, a construct, a representation of this reality. And that is what we use and manipulate when we are thinking. And that's, that's what con cognition is and leads to certain actions. The main proponents of that, I've quoted Fodor, Pilish, um Also, Chomsky can be considered a, a, a cognitivist. Um, within music, this can be seen in the work of Jackendorf and Leerdahl, Pressing, Johnson Led, Norgard. The last three are, are particularly important in jazz. I'm a jazz major, so <laughs> I naturally know the, the, the jazz people probably more than the others. Um, but the example I'll give um, with that pressing, um, that pressing proposes of cognition, um, let me actually skip to the next slide because it'll make more sense. Basically, so cognition is construed as input, process, output, essentially. That's computationism. Um, and the input would be the perception of sensory, sensory phenomena that are, that are turned into these representations and that, that is used for cognition and that leads to certain action. How, how pressing, um, how press, Pressing's conception of that within jazz on improvisation is that we take in what he calls a referent. A referent is basically a formal structure um, that a piece is comprised of. That would be the melody, harmony, the rhythm, etc. 
And that together with the things that I have within my memory, so scales, arpeggios, all those things, one uses those and turns them into, well, processes those things and turns them into the actions that one would do when, we're, when they're improvising, essentially. What I argue is that this isn't exactly the case. It doesn't feel like that's the case, nor is it, um, there is supporting evidence that that isn't exactly what happens. And I will give an example in particular for, for this, is that in artificial intelligence, I guess, there, an author by the name of Beth Preston, she talks about how improvisation and planning are often assimilated to the same thing. So they are essentially seen as variants of each other, where if I was to improvise from a typical um, AI perspective, that would be seen as a mere variant of classical planning, which they, they term something like online planning. Um, the simulation also goes the other way, where, where improvisers may see um, planning as, as um, a mere variant of improvisation. And I guess the, 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 uh, an analogy you can say there is like, fine, you made a plan, but you didn't plan the plan. So yeah, they, they can be assimilated. To, um, they can be assimilated, though there is the argument against that. And I'll get to that. Um, and that is similar to my argument against why we should not think that we think like computers. So theories that oppose this computationalism include, um, they, they, they are grouped under the umbrella term of post-cognitivism. So post-cognitivism is basically anti-computation. They don't think that we think through representations they don't think that representations are necessary for cognition. And two examples that I will use in, in, in this paper are ecological psychology and embodied cognition. Ecological psychology is basically the idea that organis an organism and an environment exist as a system, exist within and as a system, and that the Cognition involves the, the perception of affordances, what the environment and the, 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 the relationship between the organism and the environment um, allows for, what actions are, can, can happen within that. Embodied cognition is influenced by ecological, I mean, yeah, by ecological cognition. And embodied cognition sees the mind as not being the center of cognition, as is posited by cognitivists, but instead uh, with the body playing a fundamental role in cognition. And this means that representationalism is not, the representations are not necessary for cognition to occur. Supporting evidence for this, it, for the embodied perspective, is brought forward by a pianist by the name of Vijay Ear. He quotes, um, he quotes various neurological studies and, be, and behavioral scientists, but essentially what it comes down to is that, at least while we're performing or listening to music, which in itself can be seen as a co-performance really, because when we're listening to music, we're not passively listening to music, even if we think we are. What happens is that we, as people, hear music and there's rhythmic information, for instance, within that, the music. What happens when we perceive rhythm is that we, the, there are mirror neurons in our brains that allow us to essentially copy the things or imitate the things that we hear. So these mirror neurons essentially allow us to synchronize our movements to whatever rhythms we're hearing. So in essence, when we're listening to music, at least the rhythmic parts of the music, what, we, what, we, what happens is that the, the body is prepared for movement. So what, and what we're hearing, it also 
sorry, side note, music can also be seen as the, the performance of music can be seen as the sound that is created by bodies moving within time. Typically, until very recently, it's always been the case that a, the performance of music was done physically with instruments. So, and to play an instrument obviously takes movement, it takes action. So in what, what would happen is we would be, when we hear music, we are literally hearing bodies moving and synchronized through time. Um, so it's temporally organized. So when we hear music, we are essentially hearing that. And what it allows us to do is to, it, what it hinges on is our ability to synchronize our movements, which is facilitated by, by oral mirroring, essentially. And this is coming from the embodiment um, perspective. So essentially, there is no middle step. There's no need for the representations to, to occur, uh, to facilitate um, this, this cognition of the rhythm that's happening. Instead, Oh, the sound just <laughs> went weird. Um, instead, what happens is that we, there, there's no middle step, essentially, what I'm saying. There's no middle step. And what happens is that we simply perceive and our bodies react to that perception. So that, that would refute the representationalist point of view, essentially. Why is this important? I think this is important because if, if this is true, which I, and, and there's a lot of evidence behind it that, that, that it is true, it, it brings forward the, the reality that our conceptions of the way that we think are not, exactly, are not exactly based on any sort of truth for humans in particular. They're more based on a cognitive model that's influenced by how we see computers. And perhaps that could be human Pygmalion complex where we just, we create, uh, we, we, we created these contraptions and we fell in love with them and started to identify with them. But in reality, we don't think like that. We need to acknowledge that we don't think like that. And I think that us not thinking like that is I mean, the acknowledgement of us not thinking like that would allow us to break down what um, an author by the name of Plumwood terms dualism. Dualism is related to the whole notion of dichotomy and all of that, but in, in dualism, there's an implied hierarchy. Um, so, for instance, a thing like man versus nature. There's an implied hierarchy there with the former being seen as, as the superior, with the, the latter being seen as inferior. I believe that the cognitivist claim of seeing us as simply information processing units is an example of man versus nature. We, it, it, it basically does not see us, that does not see cognition as something that happens in an embodied fashion. It sees cognition as something that occurs passively. We simply, we simply process information. And I think the acknowledgement of the differences of these two, uh, these two phenomena is important in, in breaking down this dualism so that we can have a true understanding of both phenomena, so that we can truly understand how human cognition works how we, how we can understand how computer, um, how computer information processing works. And that would allow us, I mean, as, for instance, as musicians, to be able to, if you are into HCI, you could create, create contraptions com using computers, but that do not assume that humans think like computers. That, and, and I think that would be of, that would help in the usability of, of, of such such contraptions. The just the gen, but on, on another note, it would also help with the modeling of human cognition 
through even computers and, and because we would have a proper understanding of how we truly think. So that is essentially what my paper is about. Um, the, how this came about was through many conversations with Mr. Herbst. Um, he, had, um, he had said something about AI initially, and this was probably in my fourth year. And so then I started looking into that, and that led to my, my, my master's. And as I went down the rabbit hole that a master's often, often is, I just came to, to realize that, because what I was initially trying to do was build a, an, improvising, an improvising model. Um, but then I went down a lot of rabbit holes, and I came to the conclusion that there's too many assumptions about human cognition that I just don't believe, and it seems like, it seems like they're just untrue. And so how can we, and I, this, this is part of why I, I believe this is important, how can I build a, something, a, a programmed thing that is meant to model what I would do as an improviser perhaps, but it's based on assumptions of human cognition that are not true, because it, it would just reinforce things that are not true, I think, and I think it wouldn't move the, it wouldn't move our understanding of human cognition forward. So that is my motivations for this, for this paper. Um, yeah, I'll open the floor for any questions. so much, Bonga. It's really cool to see that you're working in these realms, um, and I'm excited to hear your work. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's interesting that you're, it's a kind of different perspective to the way that I, I did this um, seminar on machine listening, um, which was sort of coming from, ooh, starting from the, the machine, mm. um, and, and seeing how it uh, is different from from human yeah. um, cognition, but um, I assume you are familiar with George E. Lewis's yes, work yes. and his yeah. Voyager piece. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of interesting things that he writes about um, computer agency that actually do um, kind of reinforce this. Um, pairing of the, the human um, cognition and the yeah. computer cognition. And I'm really, yeah, I'm really excited to see how you navigate this in your work, because it can also be, if you just acknowledge that it's not the same kind of processing, then you're essentially acknowledging that it's another um, uh, kind of instrument yeah. and entity that has its own ways that are exciting to work with. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's less of a question and more of a comment. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, yeah, yeah, um, yeah it was, it's been weird, I guess, because of George, who he is, and the, 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 just how respected he is within the field, and coming to the point of like disagreeing with it, it's been, it's been weird. Um, but I think, like that's the nature of academia. We, 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 these things are debated all the time, and I think it's important for, the, for those debates to happen. But yeah, his work is really interesting. I do find his reading a little bit, uh, reading his stuff a little, yeah, it's, it's hectic. <laughs> but his, I just, I really don't think that, I, I, I'm not saying that computers do not, cannot rather have agency, I mean, perhaps we'll, we'll see computers having agency with a AI wherever it's going now. But I don't think that we, even if it does have a form of agency or something that we can see as agency, I don't think that we should think that that is necessarily grounded in the same thinking way, mechanisms that we have. 
Yeah. The, the, yeah, that's really all I'm, I'm saying and mm. my research has been pointed towards. Yeah. It's really good to disagree with people, especially when they're famous. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Corinna. Thank you, Bonga. Really, really in interesting stuff. I mean, the, the debate around computationalism in psychology has, of course, been raging for quite a while now. And I really like that you've turned this, the, the, the perspective of the sort of jazz improvisatorial kind of um, sensibility onto this debate. I think that's, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, one question around that and is whether you've perhaps thought a little bit about, I mean, we, we know that the, the computational kind of model, the cognitivist model, is not all that good. Um, and that's, I think it's really important to show that out. But I'm wondering whether you've thought about some models that perhaps do work um, for thinking about cognition in jazz kind of environments. And I'm thinking especially of people um, like Mark Duffman's work on distributed co cognition, mm. distributed creativity. And what's really interesting there is I guess we're getting closer to the, the type of um, machine learning thinking um, or thinking about how agency and subjectivities are distributed in a group of people around. And if you think about sort of more recent machine learning models, we're starting to see that that distribution of work across a network um, rather than just one point of in-out kind of computation. Mm. Mm. So I think, I think that's quite cool. Um, but the other question that I kind of have snuck in there is that I, I think that humans, they're not like computers, but they're deeply bound up with computers. And I, I'm going back to Donna Haraway, right, in, in the 1980s, who speaks about humans as cyborgs. And the, the, the opening play that you had about, you know, can we imagine ourselves without our phone or our computer or something, mm. I think that re-emphasizes exactly how cybernetic we are, right? If you take away a child's cell phone these days, then it's like cutting right. off a hand, right? <laughs> yeah. um, or cutting off an ear or cutting a little bit of the brain out that does the Google search, you know? Um, so I think, I think even though we're not like computers, I think there is a very powerful symbiotic relationship there that might complicate some of the ideas around just the projection of computer onto person or mm. person onto computer mm. and that actually these two things are two agents. Um, I would kind of say that computers definitely are agents but I come from Bruno Latour and all those guys um, but that they agents working together in some kind of way and and maybe what does that do around the the complication of the cognitivist, representationalist kind of model of psychology. Mm. Oh, yeah. I'll start with your second yeah. one first. <laughs> um, I, I agree. I really do think we are like essentially cyborgs now. Yes, it's not implanted in our brain. I mean, perhaps it will be. But we do function that way. And we, I guess I said it jokingly, but we really do not function without computers anymore. Um, and I think that's, that's part of the reason why I think that we need to, we need to have a, a, a deep understanding as to the differences between how we think and how computers think. Because if we're going to have such an interrelated relationship, we need to understand what the differences are so that so that, that relationship can be based on truths, essentially. Or um, can be so that the machines that we use, if we are using them to facilitate our actions so that they can best facilitate those actions. Yeah. On the first question, I'm just trying to <laughs> rewind. O what was the first question again? Uh, distributed. Oh, yes. How, okay, my, my, my master's is actually in, it's more on, in music interaction than specifically um, music cognition. And the way I've thought about it is more from a, a social cognition point of view. Um, so the model that I've created speaks about first how music, how cultures create music through a, a socially shared value system of what, um, what constitutes music and how we create instruments and then 
and then through that we are able to perform essentially it's from the perspective of inter in interaction ritual theory really so that low shading <laughs> yeah it is so just saying sit tight for a sec the generator will kick in in a minute there we go i love that sound <laughs> Technology. <laughs> Let there be light. <laughs> Oh, it's still on. <laughs> Bonga, I interrupted you. Yeah. The uh, improvisation and social yeah. interaction. Yeah. Um, so I think that interaction in general is based on the sharing of, I guess, a common ground. And I think how it happens through humans, at least, is through things that uh, are talked about in the, cogn the, the, the cognitive sciences, such as the embodiment um, and entrainment, etc. But from, I, I assume you talk, you, you're talking more about distributed systems that are computations, like computationally based, or are you talking yeah. more, not? Okay, yeah, I've mostly thought about it from, from, from the perspective of social, Cognition, and I guess there's a there's an ecological there, there is an ecological perspective on that, where we, the way I see it is that we essentially create environments within which we interact. So that that viewpoint is how I see social cognition, how I see interpersonal interaction, even interaction with instruments which I see as kinds of environments in that they, they, they allow us to act through them but they also restrict our actions and they're designed to facilitate certain actions. So I, I, think of them, I think of them and interaction in general as always being facilitated through uh, an environment, so an ecology really. Yeah. If I may make a concluding uh, um, or a, a remark in conclusion. I think what, uh, what, what I find in interesting about your work is that this is practice-based. You, you haven't spoken very much about your jazz improvisation, your, your viewpoints on jazz improvisation. But what I find fascinating about your work, about our conversations, is the fact that um, this is a musician who is seeking insight into how communities interact or how agents interact, how uh, within an ensemble environment, this thing called improvisation, musical improvisation, how that works. And I think that to me, you haven't spoken about that quite a, uh, in, in, in great depth, but to me that is the most um, uh, fruitful uh, or the, the, the richest theme that you are about to, to explore. So mm. thank you very much. Um, thank you. It was, it was a most interesting way too short uh, <laughs> int introduction <laughs> introduction thank sure. you sure thank you so much <laughs> oh <laughs> Bye.